Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune. The subscriber identity model, in other words, SIM card, is today an element used by billions of people across the world to communicate to their family, friends, and use it in other forms of communication. Unfortunately, it has become the target of illicit financial flows as it is one of the ways in which fraud has become rampant in society. At times, it can post a security threat. What really is happening in that area and how can societies, especially telephone companies, reduce the risks, especially with increasing terrorism using the mobile telephone as their major source of income generation and operational capacities. My guest today is one of the finest brains in the domain of combating SIM card fraud across the world. British business expert of the mobile telephone companies, Andy Kent, is my guest. Andy Kent, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much. When a British like you, who has spent so many years in the mobile telephone industry, sits one day to create a company to deal with subscriber identity issues, what does that entail? Basically, I've been in the telecommunication industry over 40 years now. But 10 years ago, I was invited to Afghanistan to look at a particular problem. And from that, I found this major fraud, which is what we've been talking about here in Cameroon, Simbox fraud and GSM gateway fraud. What, what does that mean when you talk of Simbox fraud and GSM? It's just, just break it down for my audience. It's basically using legal SIM cards illegally for terminating international telephone minutes into a country. There is a profit in there for the fraudsters to make money very quickly by transmitting all the internal international calls at a lower rate than that they pay normally. You are talking of handling issues which have to do with the SIM card. How possible is fraud in the SIM card system where it has to go through a series of networks? It's not actually in the SIM card and people should not worry about actual SIM card fraud or their own personal SIM cards. It's in actually using SIM cards that are bought legally to actually deliver these international minutes. So I just want to make your viewers very clear that it's not their own SIM cards. These are just general SIM cards that they use. But you know, um, there are telephones uh, with SIM cards and telephone without SIM cards. How do you make the difference? The difference is, is that the perpetrators purchase the SIM cards or obtain the SIM cards and use them in equipment away from the normal telephones. They just deliver the local calls. For instance, if I make a call from the UK using a calling card, it may use a lower quality route and this gets delivered over this SIM card fraud. Just how much yearly, roughly, is this illegal business costing the mobile telephone companies and users? What is the estimated cost of fraud yearly? The estimated cost in 2013, the CFCA, an organization that's looking at fraud, estimated over $46 billion for mobile fraud worldwide. Of that, it was broken down to over $3 billion for fraud on Simbox alone. I actually believe it is more than that. You were in Pakistan and headed Pakistan's largest uh, telecommunications uh, 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 giant. What struck you most in Pakistan that led to the creation of Revector, which is a think tank today, 
providing globally acceptable um, solutions in combating uh, SIM fraud? I was in Pakistan and I first came across fraud. Um, it was in the days of analog mobile networks mm. and there was different types of fraud such as analog mobile cloning where phones would be cloned. Um, my interest then went to start my own private business and working out in places like Afghanistan, Jamaica, Haiti, Ghana, Kenya, I found that this subject was quite rife and it was an epidemic worldwide. Mm. Who, who, who benefits in all these businesses? Are they the consumers, the users, or the benefits of this fraud goes to the mobile telephone networks? No, actually the opposite. The mobile telephone networks lose out. The governments really lose out because they're losing taxes and then the consumers lose out because they're charged more or their quality of service is not good. So what is the intention of your work? Is it to make companies regain or get back their lost revenues or to protect the consumers? It's twofold. Where do you draw the lines? It's twofold. It is first of all, I am working with the operators and governments to protect their interests and recover the revenues, but also in actually building the quality of the networks to help them stop this fraud so the consumers get a better deal. How is the chain of fraud in this SIM card? How does it look like? Because my audience are those, this is not an advert who has um, the local um, networks, uh, mobile telephone network, MTN, um, uh, Nestel, um, Camtel, Orange, how does it work in that world? It is an invisible world. It's an invisible Technically, how does it work? It's an how can I cheat a company if I have to manipulate my phone, the SIM card? It's not, you're not manipulating your own phone. Mm. Let me make it quite clear here, is that you are, if you want to be a fraudster, you buy many thousands of SIM cards and put them into equipment that can deliver telephone calls automatically. How is that equipment called? That equipment is a GSM gateway or a SIM box, mm -hmm. commonly known in the industry as a SIM box mm -hmm. or a SIM server. Okay. So basically, you put your SIM cards, you're the fraudster, you buy SIM cards, and then you sell telephone minutes, international mm -hmm. telephone minutes, mm -hmm. into places such as Cameroon or Ghana mm -hmm. or Kenya mm -hmm. to get rewards. Okay, so basically what you are saying is that uh, there should be governments across the world should be taking steps of reducing the number of different SIM cards or if you like telephone numbers that an individual can own in order to s reduce the, the rate of corruption from where other issues will come in. Um, security, you know that in places like Pakistan, uh, the Taliban or uh, Al-Qaeda is very effective in using such strategies yeah. in communications. I, I totally agree and what we're finding now governments such as Pakistan maybe the Cameroon are putting in are putting in processes to make certain that individuals have to register their identity when purchasing SIM cards mm -hmm. so somebody cannot go into shops and buy thousands of SIM cards mm. they're re they are put into individual accounts okay you created um, Revecto a um, few years ago roughly tell me how much revenue you have collected? How much fraud have you prevented? It's, it's difficult to say because we actually find the SIM cards electronically and we tell the operators what the numbers are so they can suspend these numbers. They've got the records of how much traffic has been used and how much cost has been lose. But we have found millions and I'm talking millions of SIM cards being used in this fraud in around 100 countries now around the world. Around 100 countries in the world. Are there security threats to these issues of fraud? Absolutely. The security issues are expansive. Basically, if SIM box is used, nobody knows who's actually calling who because there is an extra number in the food chain so 
there is security threats and the security of each country could be under threat where people know, don't know who's calling who. My audience in Cameroon listening to you talk will probably say that, okay, this is probably one of the solutions of tackling uh, communications by militants of Boko Haram. You worked in Pakistan where you managed these operations. Did you get a sense of connection in what you are saying with the operatives of Al Qaeda, the Taliban, today you can add Islamic State? All frauds bring in revenues. And, you know, if you look around the world, people need to generate money to fund these activities. And my personal feeling, and I know that I believe that some of these funds, such as in the countries you've mentioned, are being used to, to fund um, these activities. So that is one spin-off of um, this fraud. You, you have huge experiences in the telecommunications uh, domain. You have worked in Hong Kong with Quality Net. You have been in Kuwait. You have been with uh, Airset International, Cisco, BAT, Software Applications, House, and many others, NTT. What are the technological innovations that can help solve the problems of SIM card fraud? It's, it's not just technical um, um, evaluations or um, it's not just technical issues that can solve the problem. It's actually a bit of process as well. So process comes from leadership. Um, so there's two things is one is that governments regulators and operators should have strong processes in place but then on the equipment side my company has developed sophisticated equipment to identify these issues map out these issues where they are and actually locate these issues but you know when you have to do all of this it, it will enter into the world of surveillance it will enter into the world of um, uh, uh, freedom of communications and whatsoever you know what the NSA is going through in the United States of America. When you do all of these businesses, civil liberties are not infringed? No, I don't think so. If Obviously, I can't talk about the NSA and what are they doing and everything else, but SIM box fraud is a crime committed by ordinary people to international gangs. Um, to find those people, you're, you've got to utilize the information that's available. And one of the things that I say when I'm interviewed around the world is um, subscribers using mobile phones, their liberties are not infringed if they're just using normal phones. Okay. I, I know that when you travel across the world, uh, there is one uh, technological issue which has to do with putting your telephone on roaming. Um, most um, telephone users will tell you that roaming is very expensive and they don't know the kind of mathematical and airwaves calculations that happen in such a domain. Is that where in particular this issue of um, SIM card fraud comes in? No, it, it's, it's completely separate than that. Um, roaming is just set the rate which the operators charge and to do international business and again I travel very often and I rarely use roaming as much as, you know, as I can because it just is too expensive. Mm. But it's not affected the users. And again, you know, speaking on behalf of the governments or the mobile operators, the consumers need just to protect themselves by looking at those issues I, themselves. I said somewhere in the beginning that certain phones, um, such as the CDMA, such as the TDMA or AMPS, do not use a SIM. Instead, the required data is programmed directly into the phone. It can be um, the full size, which is about 85.6 millimeters, or the mini SIM, about 25 millimeters, and whatsoever micro SIM, nano SIM. How do you go through all those? issues in establishing fraud every there is many many frauds Let, let's take for example the micro sim yeah the micro sim again it's just a sim card and fraudsters will use it how it can be used in um in sim card fraud but 
every type of system has vulnerabilities. And so when I said at the beginning, across the world of mobile, there is $46 billion lost in fraud. Mm -hmm. This can come from identity theft, um, international premium rate issues, all sorts of scams. What I'm doing is trying to start with one major fraud and focus on that and clear that up in the industry. Okay, but by 2010, the Washington-based um, group or um, Global Financial Integrity, headed by Raymond Baker, concluded in 2010 that you have about one trillion dollar already lost by developing countries through illicit financial flows. Does the SIM card fraud dialectics fall in the illicit financial flow jargon? I, I believe so, yeah. The, the size of this fraud, as I've said with Revector, my company has worked in 100 countries. Daily, we see losses to the operators. But you've got to take it back to the government. The government gets a tax for um, providing a license to the operators. It gets a tax for the minutes that are coming into the country and it gets a tax for the profits of the operators. So the government and the regulators have a chance to regulate this in developing countries such as Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, they should actually look at this and say, right, let's put some processes in place. When, we, when you're talking of regulation, uh, telecommunications regulatory board across the world in the UK, in Cameroon, in Nigeria, but one major complaint of citizens who say that there is an infringement into the liberties of people. There is this issue that oh, the mobile operators will say that, okay, government intervention is coming in too much and that disturbs the dynamics of a free market. What kind of regulation are you talking about? I'm talking about, for instance, again, um, registering SIM cards with national identity whether you see that as a, an infringement of civil liberties or not, it's a way of protecting... But you know that there are countries in the world where citizens do not have national identities. Nigeria recently began the national identification process because previously uh, people did not have identity cards. In the US, if you are not a civil servant or you are not a worker, you don't have the social security number, which is like the national identity card. Now, those who don't have national identity cards, are they deprived of telephone numbers? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. So, so how do you check them? I don't know. I don't know. This is the issue for the government of how do they actually distribute to these um, visitors or, you know, foreign workers who come into a country. They've got to look at that. From my point of view, what I'm talking about with government is the processes to say there is this fraud, it is losing money for the so country. For example, a student um, are from five or middle class student, 14 years, is that child or teen deprived a telephone number? No, no, I don't think so. Who is so. yet to have a national identification number, if you take the I case of the US, because it is the national the so social security service number which says like your national identity card yeah um, so how do you track people like that I, I, I that is not my um, expertise but I, I don't think that is an issue because the governments have got to look at how they actually on one hand register SIM cards and on the second hand um, actually allow the community to grow mobile phones over the last 20 years has made business grow, especially in countries like Cameroon and South Africa, where communications has become, you know, from nothing to, you know, many, many millions of subscribers. You, you have huge experiences of unlocking all of this in, in Asia. You have been in Hong Kong, one of the biggest financial hubs of the world. You have been in UK and London in particular, the Europe's financial capital. Um, you have worked in the US, Pakistan in the Middle East. You have worked in, in Africa. Which region of the world constitutes more of a challenge to SIM card fraud? 
I don't think there's any particular reason. There's, again, it's SIM card fraud is coming down to an arbitrage of tariffs where you get a differential between international tariffs and local tariffs. In Europe, some of these have become quite equal. So SIM card fraud has, has, has started to disappear. Mm. South America, it's the same as Africa, where it's a big issue, and same in Asia. So it's worldwide, it's worldwide. We've tested over 100 countries, and 95% has showed SIM box fraud. Roughly, you will be coming to an end. Just tell me the successes Revector has achieved. I know that you won a Queen's Innovation Award uh, some years back. Concretely, back home, what have you achieved that gives you that cloud that you can do business internationally to solve the problem that you and I are talking? We've developed some sophisticated software and equipment that's running 24 hours a day. As we sit here, we're finding SIM cards electronically in Myanmar, Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, Honduras, worldwide. And even here in the Cameroon, we tested a couple of days ago when I arrived and I found that 65% of all international calls coming into the country from the routes I used was coming in illegally. So my successes and my company's successes is developing the sophisticated equipment to actually allow operators to close these SIM cards down within a minute. We've also developed sophisticated equipment to actually detect and locate the areas where these equipment is working. And we can actually pinpoint exactly within a few meters of where the equipment is. So our success is, is finding this equipment and in some countries we have made raids with the government. Or the Does that handle internet fraud? You know that most communications today, of course, are done online. You can talk of Skype and many others. Does your sophisticated equipment you are talking about handle that aspect equally? It's, it's a new Because challenge. you know internet cheating is becoming one of the most recurrent themes of the current century. As we, as we go forward, the internet has changed a lot over the last 10 years. And mobile fraud is developing into mobile and internet fraud. And the next question is there's new applications called over-the-top services such as Viber, WhatsApp, and these are taking some of the business away from the mobile operators. But it's also opening up new frauds in this world. And Revector, leading company in the UK and worldwide, is already starting to get involved in finding these internet um, applications which are causing losses to government and to the mobile operators. British mobile companies expect and Revector Director General Andy Kent, I'm afraid we have to end here. Thanks very, Thank very much, much indeed for being guest on Globe Watch. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're Hi. welcome. You're welcome. You just talked about the head coach of the Demotable Lions and we also what happened in, in Equatorial Guinea because Cameroonians were shocked that people like uh, Clinton G were taken out of the pitch, and these are the people who qualified the team to play for Equatorial Guinea. What if such occurrences take place again where the life of the national team is rested in what some people call the reckless decisions of coaches? Yeah, you know, as far as football is concerned, um, there are many coaches in the national team like Cameroon Indomitable Lions, because the coach... Who are the other coaches apart from the... Spectators, spec <laughs> spectators are coaches, uh, journalists are coaches, because journalists, they don't follow... Government officials are coaches? Yeah, of course. Okay. Even, uh, even some football administrators are coaches. Um. But, uh, you know, uh, head coach is the one following daily the team. Because uh, I don't think a coach can... Uh, said he should put out a player who can bring him a victory. This is why I spoke with uh, Mr. Finker and he told me at that time Mr. J. Clinton was not ready to, to do what he did during uh, 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 matches, qualifying matches. This is why he said 
Jay Clinton is a very good, young, talented football player, mm. so he should not put him in the front of this. And so Kamunia will start saying, oh. And as soon as the competition ended in Equatorial Guinea, the next day is that we saw him playing in France and scoring. The, yes, but. How do you explain all of that? No, no, the pressure. A lot is, of gymnastics. No, no, the pressure is not the same.